The indignation of civilized mankind is openly expressed by the President of the United States, Harry S. Truman. We do not wish to see unnecessary or unjustified suffering, but the laws of God and of man have been violated and the guilty must not go unpunished. <laughs> Nothing shall shake our determination to punish the war cri criminals, even though we must pursue them to the ends of the earth. But the president insists on fair trials and appoints Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson to persuade the Allies to the American view. In June, a month after the surrender, Jackson goes to London, seeking agreement with British, French, and Russian representatives on war crime trial procedures. In July, at the Potsdam Conference, Truman still finds resistance to long, drawn-out trials. Churchill is quoted privately as favoring summary executions for six or seven top Nazis. Stalin stubbornly clings to the view he expressed at Tehran when drinking a toast to the quickest possible justice for all German war criminals, the justice of a firing squad. But among Americans, there are those opposed to punishing the Nazi war leaders. Senator Robert A. Taft argues that the state is responsible for criminal acts committed during wartime. Individuals merely obey orders. The trial of the vanquished by the victors, he says, cannot be impartial, no matter how hedged about with forms of justice. But prodded by Truman's insistence that civilization has a right to defend itself, Jackson presses negotiations with the Allied representatives. British Attorney General Sir David Maxwell Fife, Soviet Major General I.J. Nikichenko, and Judge Robert Falco of France. In August, the London Agreement is signed, creating an international tribunal to try the Nazi leaders. On the second day of the trial, Justice Robert H. Jackson makes a four-hour speech that has become a classic of courtroom argument. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. In the summer of 1946, the Nuremberg trial's prolonged autopsy on Nazi history comes to an end. On July 26, Justice Robert H. Jackson addresses the tribunal for the last time. In eight months, a short time as state trials go, we have introduced evidence which is, embraces as vast and varied a panorama of events as has ever been compressed within the framework of a litigation. It is impossible in summation to do more than outline with bold strokes the vitals of this trial's mad and melancholy record, which will live as the historical text of the 20th century's shame and depravity. Only those who have failed to learn the bitter lesson of the last decade can doubt that men who have always played on the unsuspecting credulity of generous opponents would not hesitate to do the same now. They stand before the record of this tribunal 
as blood-stained Gloucester stood by the body of his slain king. He begged of the widow, as they beg of you, say, I slew them not. And the queen replied, then say they were not slain, but dead they are. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, that there are no slain, that there has been no crime.